Okay, guys, the big question in this position is, should we take the rook on f5 or should we play bishop d4? And this is actually the main difference between advanced players and the rest <laughs> and the rest of us. And look, I see it every day with my students. Those who cannot break through the 2000 line is because they move up the ladder because they're really good at tactics. They've been training tactics like crazy, but they neglect strategy, positional chess, and more importantly, they neglect starting endgames. And truth is that sooner or later, it is going to get to you. You're going to hit a plateau because you were not training every single area as you moved up the ladder, like we discussed on lesson 102. So anyhow, here, just to go straight to the point, guys, many of us are going to go for the exchange. We get the rook, but the problem is that the black pieces get some counterplay. So they could do bishop e3 check, then they collect hitting the queen, they're hitting the knight, so it is not as clear. However, at this point in the course, if you guys already went over lesson number 52, if you went over lesson 41, 42, you should be able to visualize the end game that we might get after bishop d4. So number one, we look at candidate moves. We have talked about this so much. Bishop f5, bishop d4. We look into each one of them and we visualize the resulting position. Now, if you have not been following this YouTube channel from the beginning, well, at least you should know that chess is all about pattern recognition right and we talk we have talked so much about tactical patterns like just getting the exchange forks pins and so on but we gotta talk and reinforce positional strategic patterns as well and that's why only some of you guys are gonna be able to quickly detect there is a weak pawn on e6 there is a weak pawn on b5 and this is going to be a liability for my opponent this is going to make it very easy to convert an end game so instead of going for this unclear variation we go bishop d4, and then after bishop takes, queen takes. Don't forget, I'm thinking of the end game. So if I could trade off queens, then less, less counterplay for my opponent, the closer I get to the end game, and the, the, the more these pawns become liabilities for the black pieces. So after queen takes, pawn takes, this is officially, guys, a backward pawn. So if you don't know what this is or how to take advantage of backward pawns, you got to go back to lesson 42, 43. And then, of course, you got the pawn on b5 that cannot be defended by, no, by another pawn either. And if you go a little, bit, a little bit deeper, well, you're going to pay attention to the minor pieces. Look at this bishop blocked by the pawns in the center. That's a bad bishop. And, of course, you got this knight at the edge. It could be fixed, but still, it is going to be... Uh, our minor pieces are going to be better than the black pieces, bishop and knight. So after rook takes, rook takes, guys, if they don't take, we're going to take them. So, of course, they have to do something about it. And now we get into we're getting closer into this endgame. And if you think about it, everything was guys pretty much forced. If you don't take me, I'm going to take you. And I continue to hit this rook. Because the thing is, I don't want to take it if you're going to get counterplay. But now that I did bishop d4, I'm ready to take on a five, even rook f5, because we have a pin. So anyhow, we got to that endgame. Now, how do we convert? How do we convert this position into a win? Well, I want to pay attention to the pieces that I simplify. Don't forget, simplification is about the pieces that you leave on the board, not only about what you take. So ideally, I would leave my opponent with this bad bishop and I try to capitalize on the weak pawns. Now, many times, one weakness is not enough. We have talked so many times about the principle of the second weakness. So there's one weakness over here. I gotta make sure that I leave him with another weakness on the queen side. That way, they cannot defend them both so here pawn to g4 hitting that knight they have to do something about it and now a takes before a takes before this is an isolated pawn guys isolated pawn and we got a backward pawn none of them are able to be defended by pawn so that means that bishops knights rooks have to be defending it if we remove all of the minor pieces and the rooks then the king has to be slave to defending those pawns. So now before I tell you, before I show you how the game continued, guys, try to make it interesting. Try to come up with the follow-up plan. You know the main idea, but let's try to do what we learned from Capablanca on lesson number 90, 91. Think of the ideal position that you want for your pieces. Where do you want the king to end up? Where do you want the knight? Where do you want the rook? And if you do that consistently, guys, in your games, whenever you're practicing, you're going to get so good at it that it's going to become natural to you. Just like when you find a fork or a pin, these ideas that are deeper, they're going to become very familiar to you. So look, basically what we want now, we want this knight to go to e5. We should be able to identify that outpost for the knight. By definition, in front of every uh, backward pawn there's going to be a weak square and we're going to use it 
for our knight. Now the king, we know end games, we gotta centralize the king and we bring it to e3. And then don't forget, I want to leave them with the bad bishop. So if I could trade this knight, great. Also because he's defending the weak pawn. Uh, so anyhow, the game continued with knight f3, very simple, nothing extraordinary. Knight e8, knight gets to e5. So first part of the plan is already done. And then next, I gotta bring the king, I gotta centralize the king. So knight d6, looking for good squares for the knight. There is none. So king f2, bishop a6, trying to trade the bishop. Guys, we cannot have it all. At least they get to trade bishops. But anyhow, we're going to have the superior position. So king e3, king is centralized, knight is centralized. And after bishop takes, immediately I'm going to be putting pressure on the weak pawn. Very important, at this moment, I want to remember that this is my win. My win is going to be on the weak pawns. And I'm saying this because here it doesn't really work, but sometimes your opponent is going to try to create counterplay, right? And here, again, it doesn't work because I take and I defend the pawn. But be very careful with trading pawns, uh, giving your opponent something to get the pawn. That pawn is going to be a liability for the remaining of the game. So don't give him anything. If I didn't have this move defending, I will be securing my pawn. Only then I proceed to put pressure on that pawn that is going to fall no matter what. So anyhow, in this game, we got rook c8 hitting the pawn. We take and we continue to defend. And right now, guys, we got a passed pawn. This is already pretty easy to convert for the white pieces. So rook c3, king f4, we continue to activate the king. Look at this knight. No one can hit it. And he continues to defend the pawn. That is the base pawn that defends b3. So now my king could go to e5 and go after the other weakness. So king f8, and now guys, nothing fancy. We don't need any discovered checks or anything like that. The only thing we need, and by the way, king e5, king e7, they should be fine. The only thing we need is to simplify the game. So rook f3, the closer we get to the end game, the more powerful my asset is going to become, and the more of a liability this pawn is going to be on e6. So rook f3, rook goes back, of course, king e3, king e7, king d2, and after 94, I'm simply going to hide. That said, guys, I don't need to prove anything. I don't need my king to get checkmated. This is already won. It doesn't matter if it takes me 5, 10, 15, 20. I just cannot mess this up by getting my king in trouble. I have to be careful with the forks and everything else. So nice c3, and we're going to go ahead and put pressure on the weak pawn again. Not only that, we're pinning it, so there might be some tactics with knight d5. And there you have it, guys. Those are tactical patterns that you should identify right away. If not, you gotta go back to our lessons about tactics. But anyhow, we got king d7 getting away from that uh, pin. But then, just like we learned in our latest lesson, guys, strategy typically leads to, to tactics. So now that our pieces are active, we have so much advantage, our opponent had to uh, make some concessions. Of course, there's a tactic here that finishes the game. So see if you can find the final move that made the black pieces resigned. And if you need to post a video, guys, go ahead and do so. But basically, knight a6 hits the rook. And anywhere the rook goes, I'm going to go check, creating an interference, and then I collect the knight. But guys, even if they had not fallen for this tactic, this is going to be already... Um, this is going to be already winning with the b pawn so one thing that i would like you to do and let me know in the comments if how it goes is what we have talked about so many times take this position if you want remove the minor pieces or remove the rooks or remove everything and see if you can convert this end game against the engine and again guys if i show you here the whole thing you're gonna see how from this position the engine is actually showing bishop d4 as the top move so bishop d4 is the top move second best move is bishop f5. But if you look at the difference, 127 compared to 0.69. So I hope that as we continue to reinforce these strategic positional patterns, it becomes easier for you guys to identify them in your games. And hopefully that allows you to take your chess to the next level. With that said, I will see you in our next lesson.